Welcome back. After the longest election campaign in U.S. political history, 20 months of speeches, viral videos, online songs, gaffes, tears, and endless sound bites, you've got to ask, what do the media cover now? Well, while journalists ponder that question, here at the Listening Post, we've put together our top five media moments of the campaign. They tell a story of a grassroots internet movement that took on the mainstream media and the emergence of an increasingly influential blogosphere. But they also show how important money was in the media battle for the White House. So here are the Listening Post's top five media moments of the 2008 U.S. presidential election. This presidential election campaign shattered spending records for political advertising. The old record of $188 million was set by George W. Bush in 2004. It was broken by Barack Obama, whose ad spend exceeded $200 million. John McCain lacked the fundraising muscle of Obama. He spent around $100 million for his ad campaign. Barack Obama and domestic terrorist Bill Ayers, friends. The ad war during this electoral race was not just about money. It was about going negative. It's 3 a.m. and your children are safe and asleep. But there's a phone in the White House and it's ringing. Something's happening in the world. Who do you want answering the phone? A spectacularly misleading and, dare I say, spectacularly nasty campaign ad. In an ad-saturated campaign such as this one, fact-check websites like politifact.com and factcheck.org became key players. We've been out there, of course, doing some fact-checking. When discovered, he lied. We Obama. find the claim that Obama lied to be baseless. And I think, you know, newspapers and, uh, and television stations have also been pretty good this year about doing their own fact-checking. That's what the fact-checkers say. But who checks their facts for accuracy? Can they be trusted? Campaign 08 was comedy gold. Political satire is number four on our list of campaign media moments. News channels were not the only ones riding U.S. politics to high ratings during this campaign. An Alaskan hockey mom is a heartbeat away from the presidency. When McCain says country first, this country? Is that what he's talking about? Viewing figures for Saturday Night Live, the long-running NBC comedy show, spiked by 47% during the final stages of the election race. You went to the UN for the first time. How was that experience? I have to say, I was disheartened by how many of them were foreigners. <laughs> Shows like David Letterman's Late Show on CBS. John McCain and Jon Stewart's Daily Show on Comedy Central Senator Barack Obama drew their biggest audiences when the presidential candidates came on. As the campaign grew nastier, the wit on the satirical shows grew sharper, and non-journalists like comedy and talk show hosts were sometimes tougher on the candidates than real uh, journalists were. There's, there are ads running from your campaign. We know that those ads are untrue. They're lies. And just as they mocked the candidates, the comedians and talk show hosts sent up the mainstream media when they failed to provide real news reporting. Obviously, Fox News is a more sophisticated analysis network and understands why Governor Palin would be ready from day one. She does know about international relations because she is right up there in Alaska, right next door to Russia. Clearly, it's not just the comedy shows that are good for the occasional laugh. This election has seen the left-wing blogosphere emerge. With their ubiquitous presence and their eye for detail, American bloggers swarm the Internet, and it's their work that makes it to number three on our countdown. New media came into their own during this election. They provided up-to-the-minute observations from the campaign trail. We are in Minnesota for the Republican National Convention. And muscled their way onto the mainstream media. This is what Media Matters does. They frame questions. This is what we do. We look at what you certain. wrote. The new media fight back was on display when author Jerome Corsi's anti-Obama book, Obama Nation, was published. Jerome Corsi's book is at your bookstores. It's called Obama Nation. The book was a thinly disguised hit job on Barack Obama, and the left-wing blogosphere ripped into the book's factual inaccuracies not only on their websites, but also on the mainstream media. Well, you can put slime in the covers of a book, and it's still slime. Inaccuracies in the mainstream media's reporting were also targeted by bloggers who got under the skin of media miscreants. 
Media Matters, uh, Huffington Post, Daily Coast. I mean, these are fascists. They kept the mainstream news media honest. 2008 will be remembered as the political campaign in which the blogosphere came of age, found its voice, and made its mark. Number two on our list, we have the media circus surrounding Sarah Palin. She's exactly who I need. She's exactly who this country needs. Initially, Sarah Palin was exactly what the McCain campaign needed to draw media attention away from Barack Obama. Senator John McCain has picked Alaska Governor Sarah Palin. But Palin was to have a short media honeymoon, partly because of how inaccessible she was to journalists. She was here in New York City today meeting with world leaders at the UN. And what did the McCain campaign do? They tried to ban reporters from covering those meetings. The media's outrage at Palin's distance from them pushed the McCain campaign into scheduling a few interviews. And they would send Palin's political stock into a free fall. Do you agree with the Bush doctrine? In what respect, Charlie? When the interviews garnered poor reviews... And that is one of the most pathetic pieces of tape I have ever seen for someone aspiring to one of the highest offices in this country. Then came the clothes. This will be huge news that they yeah. spent $150,000 on her wardrobe. Although Palin did have some defenders in the media... She's doing exactly what Barack Obama told her, spreading the wealth around. <laughs> the media narrative had taken a permanent turn, and the bloom was off McCain's rose. Okay, here's the big one. Topping our list of media moments are the vice presidential and presidential debates, writ large across the television screens of America. I welcome you to the first of the 2008 presidential debates. The debates were a case of the end product falling well short of the media hype. We're not serving the people by holding debates that are controlled. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond. If we're going to just allow the candidates to speak from a script. The ultimate example of that came when Sarah Palin politely listened to the moderator's questions. Would you like to have an opportunity to answer that before? Then ignored them. And I may not answer the questions the way that either the moderator or you want to hear, but... And talked about what she wanted to talk about. But I'm going to talk straight to the American people and let them know my track record also. So why do the news media cover the debates to the extent they do? The answer lies, as it usually does in the world of television, in the ratings. This year, the three presidential debates averaged around 60 million American viewers each, with almost 70 million tuning in for the vice presidential debate. The media are constantly complaining about the debate formats and the candidates ignoring the moderator's questions. And she completely ignored it. More than ignored it. More than ignored it. <laughs> she blew me off, I think is the technical term. What they never complain about are the ratings and the revenues. More Global Village Voices now on key turning points and media moments in the U.S. election. Looking back on this campaign, the journalists in the United States should be charged with journalism malpractice if there was such a charge. They were solidly in the Democratic Party's camp behind an Obama win. They were literally invested in his victory. My favorite media moment was the way in which political satire moved from beyond late night television to actually influencing voters' decisions and candidates' actions. The debates, it seems, were often watched to have a reference point uh, for which what John Stewart and Saturday Night Live would say uh, later in the week. Um, and oftentimes it seems the debates were decided as to who won and who lost based on what these comedians said instead of the pundits, which was quite refreshing. I'll never forget the night of the New Hampshire primary when Barack Obama lost, even though he was heavily expected to win, and then went out in front of a worldwide audience and delivered his Yes, We Can speech on a night that would have crushed a lesser man. He left no doubt in anyone's mind that he would be the next president of the United States. 
Finally, we began the broadcast talking about the U.S. elections being a global story, and we'll end the show with an example of that. Here's a video by someone who calls himself a world citizen. He's from Kenya, where Barack Obama's father came from. He's a musician, an Afro-reggae artist named Ohanglaman Makadem, who's worked with a filmmaker, Katrine Ender, to produce this video that's attracting substantial traffic on the World Wide Web. It's called Obama Be Thy Name, and it's our Internet Video of the Week. We'll see you next time at the Listening Post. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day this great nation. All the voters in America, Barack Obama be thy name. Washington, D.C., open your doors for Barack, Barack Obama. For a change in America, it is a change in Africa. Australia, Asia, and Europe, South America, Barack Obama. From California to New Mexico, New Orleans to Hawaii. Alaska, Arizona to Miami, all over America, Barack Obama. And if you're footing for the real change, Barack Obama be the right man. Whether you're black or white, you're young or old, but Barack, Barack Obama. Whether you're black or white, you're young or old.